But this is one of the reasons why people who go on carnivorous diets, they feel great to start off with and then all of a sudden they get like severe chronic diarrhea or they get severe joint pain or something like that. Oftentimes it's because they're dumping oxalate and they put it down to their diet, but really it's, it's what they're not eating that is causing their body to release this stuff. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I have Elliot Overton back here today to talk all things plant toxins and why specifically some plants might be good for us for medicinal purposes, but maybe some aren't. So Elliot, tell us everything we need to know about plant toxins, specifically oxalates, why they may not be good for us. This is a, a, an interesting area of research, something I became interested in uh, probably four years ago, five years ago, maybe. And it relates to many of the health foods or foods which are typically considered healthy by the majority of people. Uh, and it turns out that sometimes foods which are considered to be nutritious and part of a healthy diet are actually contributing, at least in many people, uh, to that chronic health condition in, in more specifics, chronic pain uh, is, is very common. So in any kind of area of nutrition, aside from carnival uh, or animal-based nutrition circles, you'll find this concept that plants are basically benign, right? Plants are necessary for optimal human function. In fact, they're necessary. Human beings need to eat them to be healthy. The more plants that you eat, the healthier you are. And this is one of the things that drives the plant-based community who exists primarily on plants or all on plants, 100%. Now, in nutrition school, I was taught something very similar, although I was very skeptical at that point. This concept that you need to get so many greens. I mean, there's this concept of like five, five fruits and vegetables per day, right? Yes. Well, in nutrition school, they essentially say, you know, you should be eating 12 portions of greens or whatever. And uh, it seems a and little bit. And I did that and I had really bad side effects until I started so, carnivore, which you have different um, opinions on. But anyway. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Most people do find, many people do find that as they start incorporating more greens and more of these so called healthy fruits and vegetables into their diet, that their symptoms actually get worse. Now, sometimes it can be that when someone removes the common offenders like industrial seed oils, they remove the pro-inflammatory foods, they remove maybe dairy and gluten, which they were having some kind of an immune reaction to, uh, that all of a sudden they see improvements. And they associate that with eating more green leafy vegetables or more vegetables in general. Now, I think that sometimes it's a little bit coincidental. And in I'm not saying that sometimes maybe plants are not beneficial for human beings. What I am saying is that plants in general contain a variety of defense chemicals. In fact, you have to look at from an, an ecological perspective, an environmental perspective, plants are living organisms just like human beings. They have a, a life force. They have some kind of an intelligence. It runs through them and they have to adapt to environmental stresses. This can be herbivores. This can be insects. This can be mold, fungus. You know, it can be any number of kind of bacterial or even viral threats. Ultimately, plants have to survive. And the way that they survive is they, like human beings, have innate defense mechanisms, complex chemical cascades, which essentially deter animals from eating them, deter insects from eating them. They're basically antifungal, anti, you know, antibacterial factories, which come up with highly complex chemicals which are, in some cases, can be extremely detrimental for any other living organism which is trying to eat them, uh, but at the same time serve other purposes as well, right? This is pronounced in certain toxic plants um, which are known for their ability to be fatal in, in certain cases. You know, you've got foxglove, you've got some of the other uh, medicinal plants which, when taken in excess, can actually cause death. Now, this is also the case with other foods, which you might be surprised to hear. For instance, rhubarb. There is a case of rhubarb poisoning. Someone consuming too much rhubarb or frying the leaves um, during the, the Second World War in, in the UK and, and dying of kidney failure the next day. There's also accounts of people uh, foraging for certain plants, one being sorrel, uh, over consuming it and, and, and actually and, and dying from that. And the chemical involved in this particular situation is going to be 
oxalate or ox- oxalic acid. So for mm-hmm. those who aren't familiar with oxalic acid, it's basically, a, it's an organic acid it's found in many, many plants. In fact, uh, probably most plants in varying degrees, and it, it serves a couple of different functions. It's thought to be maybe one of the protections against pests, but it's also potentially playing a role in how a plant binds minerals in the soil. It has a very uh, strong capacity to bind with minerals. Um, and it's found in many of the so-called healthy foods in quite high amounts. So some examples I just gave, I mean, one is sorrel. Not many people eat sorrel, although you can forage for it. Another one is rhubarb, particularly in the, in the leaves. Mm. But people might be surprised to hear that oxalate is also extremely high in a staple for many people, which is spinach. Yes. Uh, there are many of the other exotic plant foods or even ordinary plant foods, which are also quite substantially high in this chemical. Uh, we have cacao or chocolate. Chocolate is very high. We have uh, many of the grains, the beans, the legumes, also very high. Many vegetables, including sweet potatoes, which are considered to be more healthy uh, because of their higher fiber content, and potentially lower starch than white potatoes. Uh, but sweet potatoes, along with white potatoes, are also very high in this chemical. Uh, mm-hmm. Certain fruits such as kiwi fruit, many of the berries like blackberries. What else have I have I not mentioned? Nuts, so, for instance. So these are really healthy foods that we should be, that we're told that we should be eating. And a lot of us eat it in large quantities. I was eating these foods in large quantities, especially when I was keto, maybe not the potato, um, but I was doing a lot of vegetables, lots of spinach. I would fill up a massive glass, loads of spinach, cacao, berries, and I'd have that every single day with avocado. Yeah, this tends to be the case, especially among like the keto community, because what will happen is, is there's this idea that, okay, so animal foods are healthy, but also plant foods are necessary. Fiber is necessary. Polyphenols and various other phytochemicals that you find in plants are necessary for health, right? And so there's this concept that, okay, if you're on keto, you can eat as much of certain foods if they're high in fat certain plant foods if they're high in fat or if they're low in carbohydrate and what that tends to translate to is foods which are also very high in oxalate and this oftentimes can actually surpass the amount that someone on an ordinary diet consume because it turns out that many of the foods like cacao powder or the berries that they they have a low glycemic index they're low in sugar therefore they can they're considered to be highly uh, beneficial, highly nutritious. And people on keto, because they're so kind of um, limited in what they can eat otherwise, they tend to overeat these foods or they become a staple. And this also applies to some of the other greens, you know, beet greens, for instance, um, beetroot by itself is high, but you have the the nuts. And this is particularly relevant when you're looking for non-gluten or non-starchy um, flowers, you know, people go on keto and they start to miss bread and they start to miss cakes. So what they like to do is they like to make uh, these kind of desserts with low sugar alternatives, but also low starch, uh, no grains because of some of the, you know, problematic elements in grains, the lactins, etc. They think that eating nut flowers is going to be safer. Well, it I turns out almond that almond flour. Right. And almond it's flour ridiculous. is... <laughs> <laughs> Look, almond flour is ridiculously high in oxalate, right? Yes. Or ridiculous. Yes. Nobody knows yes. this though. Like I was having almond flour cookies. I was I'm making two cups of almond flour cookies and eating the whole thing in one day. And that was right. feeding my sugar addiction. But because I was using monk fruit, erythritol, stevia. This, this is the thing, right? Uh, it applies to the nut milks as well. Many people find that they have a problem with dairy. So they start eating, drinking copious amounts of nut milk. They might have a smoothie with spinach cacao, nut milk, uh, <laughs> almonds, uh, you know, uh, some of the, the, the spices, which are also very high, which people also tend to overeat, cumin, turmeric, cinnamon, uh, black pepper, uh, all of these things which kind of give variety to a lower carbohydrate diet tend to fall under the category of extremely high oxalate. Now, you factor in when most people eat nuts, you know, aside from some people, I mean, cashews can be very addictive, at least in my case, but almonds, for instance, I could might have a, I don't know, a handful of almonds, but when you're using almond flour, almond flour, 
you can very easily eat copious amounts like in yeah. one sitting. There's various lists online. The one that I would go to is lowoxlate.info. That's a very comprehensive list of the extremely high foods. And you find many of the keto staples are like this. So why is this actually a problem? Well, I mentioned before that oxalate tends to have this kind of binding capacity with minerals, right? In fact, one of the main ways in which is problematic for the human body is that it tends to bind with many of our dietary minerals that are essential. One of those being calcium. In fact, people can become deficient in calcium if they eat a high oxalate diet. Uh, the thing is, is that when you consume a food which is high in oxalate, uh, basically, it's, it's usually found in the form of the plant. It's usually found bound, bound with a mineral, right? So if it's bound with calcium, for instance, it, it forms a very tight bond. So oftentimes, if you look at plant foods which are high in calcium, an example would be spinach. Uh, many of the plant-based advocates would say, well, you know, you don't need dairy or you don't need to eat this or you don't need to eat bones because actually you can eat just a, a large amount of spinach and that provides a lot of calcium. Problem is that is that it's so tightly bound with ox oxalate that the chances are you're not going to be absorbing much, if any, of that calcium. At the same time, the oxalate found is sometimes also bound with other minerals, and it can dissociate from those minerals, and it can form like free oxalic acid in the gut, or it can it can kind of uh, have because it has a very tight or it really likes calcium. What ends up happening is that if you eat another food with calcium. What it does is it binds it in the gut and it stops it from being absorbed. Mm. Now, that's a problem because, of course, dietary calcium is really important. But another issue is, is that oxalate exists not only as bound with calcium, but also with other minerals. And those other minerals are what are called soluble in water. Now, that means that we can absorb those. We absorb those directly from the gut into the bloodstream. So it turns out that there's many health conditions which are actually associated with oxalate problems or high amounts of oxalate in the body. And one of those is going to be kidney stones. And in fact, oh. around 80% of kidney stones are actually oxalate, they're, they're calcium oxalate crystals. The way that works is basically someone might eat a high amount of oxalate in the diet for a prolonged period of time. It can happen very quickly, actually, if they have an acute overdose. Mm. But oxalate is absorbed into the bloodstream, goes to the kidneys. And you see in the kidneys, it will then precipitate as oxalate stones, calcium oxalate stones. Now, sometimes this is excreted. Other times it actually remains. And, you know, someone might have to have it surgically removed or alternatively they, they pass it and it's extraordinarily painful. painful. Wow. Um, now, like that is really the main medical condition, which is conventionally thought to be involved in, in someone's having problem with oxalate. In fact, the medical community don't really acknowledge much else in terms of mm. oxalate can cause kidney stones, but if you don't have kidney stones, you can eat as much of it as possible. Problem is, is that's kind of really misses the point. It's a tip of the iceberg. It's the main manifestation that you can actually see and measure. The medical community have been really, uh, what's the word, misled in this regard. Uh, they're thoroughly wrong in that oxalate quite corrosive, okay? Um, because it binds so tightly with minerals, it forms these crystals, it forms these stones. Yeah. First of all, what I would say is if you look at um, how oxalate can be used as a, as, a, as a cleaner, cleaning product called Bartender's Keeper, I believe. Uh, we don't have it here in France, but we, they, they do have it in the US. It's actually just like it contains ox, ox, oxalic acid. And one of the reasons why it's so useful so corrosive is because it, it basically picks up the minerals which have been like solidified on surfaces and carries them away. Now, part of its corrosive nature, if you e examine it under a, a microscope, what you see is that it forms these kind of very strange, sharp objects. So you can have these very long uh, kind of spear-like objects. You can also have these crystals, it forms multiple different formations. Now, the 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 largest formation of this would be an actual stone, but it can form these at very low levels. You can even have like nano crystals that it forms. Wow. And basically you think, you think of these, uh, an easy way to kind of conceptualize this is of sh shards of glass. Okay. So is when you consume these foods in high amounts or even in low amounts to some extent, but it, it's, it's bad when you, when you have too much of it, uh, essentially it has a very irritating effect on tissue. It can become lodged, you think about your, your esophagus, your stomach, your intestine is very soft. Okay. Yeah. Soft, 
mucus um, covered kind of tissue, which is um, very susceptible to, I mean, you imagine you crush glass and you have, you know, tiny crystals and you swallow that. It's kind of, it's an oversimplified way of looking at it, but it's basically the effect that it has on local tissue. So it can become lodged. It can cause irritation. It can cause inflammation. And, you know, it can cause many gut conditions, uh, it can lodge in the nervous system and cause kind of problems with uh, the electrical communication between neurons and, and, and organs. Mm. And in that case, it's, it's very detrimental for the gut. But in terms of the actual systemic effects that it has, aside from kidney stones, mm. kidney stones is like the end point of oxalate. Basically, what I mean by oxalate or kidney stones being the end point of oxalate is that the oxalate that's getting to the kidney is also has been around the body. It's been around the body before it even gets there. And now the issue is, and this is the, the point that is not acknowledged by medicine to a large extent, is that that oxalate lodge and deposit in practically every organ of the human body. And this is really why it's so insidious. And, and in fact, this is, I think, one of the things that accounts for ma- one of the main issues with oxalate is this systemic oxalosis that occurs or systemic oxalate poisoning. Wow. And it's not really like other plant chemicals or toxins because plant toxins in general need to be processed and they have like an immediate effect Mm. with oxalate. We have to think about it somewhat differently in that it's a cumulative poison. It accumulates. And the reason is, is because as it's traveling, it's in like a water soluble form might be Mm. bound with some potassium. It's, it's, it's binding with your minerals, your electrolytes primarily, but it's binding with minerals in the blood. It can bind to iron and zinc and whatnot. So, so it's preventing them from being used, but at the same time, it can be drawn to wherever the blood is flowing to. And as it's coming into contact with uh, the local tissue, whether this is the connective tissue, whether this is your muscle tissue, whether this is your heart, your thyroid gland, your liver, your, your brain, uh, it can be really any of the internal organs and any of the tissue systemically it can become, it can precipitate. So mm. it can actually become bound with calcium. And you have these little small crystals which start to accumulate in the area. Now, it's biologically active or biochemically active. What this, this means is, is as it's penetrating into cells, it basically directly cuts through the cell membrane. So it can basically tear cells apart as it's doing that or allow stuff to get in. It isn't meant to be there. Mm. It lodge in cells. And it can start to accumulate more and more and more. You develop crystalline deposits throughout your entire body. And for some people, it's going to be different depending on where it is. In many cases, it's a point of injury where they get this kind of extra crystalline deposit. But an example of how this might manifest in someone is Mm. as arthritis. In fact, Ah, someone can have pain. Yes. Pain. And in fact, there's there's actually a condition which is oxalate induced arthritis. Okay. Now, Mm. what that basically is, is that someone has feels, you know, someone might have a problem with their elbow, be diagnosed with rheumatoid or osteoarthritis. When in fact, the inflammation that's being caused is, is basically is caused by a mechanical thing lodged Mm. in the joint. Hence, Mm. every time that you move it, you think like a a really sharp object stuck in your tissue, like that's going to, that causes ir- irritation, that causes inflammation. Okay. So how so can you get that out? So if you already have been consuming oxalates and you have that oxalate, the toxicity coming from oxalates, what can you do to reverse it? Can you do anything? You can. Uh, there's there's a couple of ways in which people do this. Aside, just, just to give a, just to expand on what we were saying before, like one example is, is, is arthritis, but actually it's been found in, for instance, the thyroid gland and in the thyroid gland, it can, it can actually mimic hypothyroidism. So people who have issues, wherever it is, it can be detected by the immune system. It's detected as a, as a stressor and you, your immune system is, is, becomes active where, where it is. So for instance, if you have it in the joints, it can present as arthritis. If you have it in the muscles, it can present as fibromyalgia. If it's in the nerves, it can be neuropathy. Thyroid gland, it can be Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, whichever organ it's in, it can cause problems. One of the main symptoms which is going to be associated with this is it can be chronic pain, but it can also be a, a variety of other kind of chronic conditions which mimic certain things, but is actually caused by 
oxalate deposits. And when you've got these very small crystals, they actually penetrate into the cells rather than being lodged in like the, uh, the extracellular space, they get into the cells and it actually prevents like how we're making energy. It triggers like inflammatory genes kind of detected by the immune system as a, as a real problem. So really these, this, this can accumulate for a long period of time and someone doesn't know that they've got it. This is the problem is that usually someone does, doesn't develop symptoms until they've been eating this stuff for a long time. Aside from the, the cases of acute toxicity, um, really someone could be eating this stuff for five years and not know they've got a problem with it. And all of a sudden, very gradually start developing like shoulder pain or muscle pain or like digestive issues or neur neuropathy or, neur you know, other kinds of um, progressive conditions. And they can't understand why they, they have it. And so the overall concept is, is that as long as you're consuming a diet which is high, you're, you're absorbing it into the blood and there's a sensing mechanism by as long as it's a high level that you've got in the blood, your body will be accumulating it, will be storing it. Now it's going to be getting rid of some all the time anyway. Okay. But people's excretion capacity is different between different people. Some people might be able to get rid of more, other people not. And there's various factors which can kind of determine that. One of the things is if someone has underlying gut issues or intestinal permeability, or even um, uh, low calcium in the diet, they're potentially going to be absorbing a lot more than the average person. So we, we have to factor in that there's lots of things that can kind of determine this. But overall, I, I would say uh, an important point to understand is that someone doesn't necessarily need to have an immediate reaction to a food for it to be causing a problem. And this is why I think it's probably the most dangerous and most insidious, because usually when it's accumulated, there's no quick way to get rid of it. And this is to answer your question. Really, the only way to get rid of this stuff is ultimately, um, and it's really difficult to test for. Testing is not going to tell you whether you've got it in your joints, whether it's inside the cells. You, you're not, you're not going to be able to see that. You, mm. A urinary test is, is something that a doctor might run, but that's only how much you're, you're excreting in that moment. So mm. that's testing is basically irrelevant. The only way to really know if someone has this problem and the only way to get it out is actually to, to provide the conditions in the body where the amount of um, oxalate coming in is, is low. So the blood amount actually drops. And the way that you do that is reducing dietary levels. And there's this sensing mechanism. I don't think it's been fully characterized. Uh, maybe Sally Norton knows more about this or Susan Owens. Mm. But the sensing mechanism, the way that it seems to occur is the body detects a drop in blood levels. And what it starts doing is the immune system starts clearing oxalate. In other words, you start mobilizing it from where you've stored it because your body wants to get rid of it. Is that so you oxalate start dumping? That's exactly what oxalate dumping is. Ah, yeah. okay. Got it. Yeah. And, and the key thing to understand is there's no detoxification pathway for oxalate. It's not like you have an oxalate sensitivity or you can enhance the detoxification pathway in the liver and therefore you can process it and, and modify it and get rid of it. It's not like that. It's basically you're getting rid of the physical substance by pulling it out of tissue. But as it's being pulled out, you know, your immune system is detecting this as an inflammation causing molecule. And what's happening is you're getting an inflammatory response. So you're pulling it out into the tissue, going, going into the blood. It's eventually being excreted over, either through the gut or the kidneys. But as it's doing that, it's causing damage, damage on the way out. You know, we spoke about how it's corrosive. Mm. So it's causing damage to the vascular system. It's binding with your, 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 your minerals. It can cause damage to the kidneys. In fact, you know, a high amount of oxalate, if someone's poisoned by oxalate, it causes acute kidney failure and someone dies, right? Or someone can go to the ER room. So it's, it's a really serious thing, like in high amounts. Yeah. We're talking about chronic low level exposure. But when you dump this stuff from the body, ultimately what happens is you have to get rid of it. And as you're getting rid of it, it's causing damage on the way out. And unfortunately for someone who has gone through a period where they, you know, they've been accumulating this for years or even decades, then ultimately it can take them several years to actually clear this stuff from the body. And the concept is that the body goes through cycles of dumping as in every, you know, couple of days or every couple of weeks, if they go onto a diet, which is lower in oxalate, the body is Con consistently kind of measuring the amount in the blood and the 
And what will happen is the sensing mechanism kicks in. You draw this stuff out of tissue, you get increased amounts in the blood and you start excreting it. But based on that, many of the old symptoms or many of the symptoms that people have from problems with oxalate actually tend to get worse. Yes. And so this concept of oxalate dumping is like cyclically re traumatizing the tissue cyclically re-traumatizing the body and re-experiencing many of the problems and it can take several months to see any kind of improvement and so i'll give you an example if someone has like an arthritis which is caused by what you might find is that as they stop eating oxalate they might see some they go through like a honeymoon phase where their symptoms start to improve like drastically they see wow like within a week actually not eating the, the raw cacao or the spinach, actually my pain seems to be a lot less, you know, I feel a lot better. And then a couple of weeks after that, all of a sudden they see, they experience severe joint pain and it lasts for maybe a couple of days. They might get cloudy urine, urine burning urine, diarrhea, yellow, you know, like blood in the stools or whatever. Like all of these signs and symptoms of like major problems, they might have signs as that they've actually got an infection. Oftentimes people think that they come down with the flu. And that is the sign that the immune system is being activated. They get swollen glands, they get all of the fever and everything like that, but they don't have an infection. They're just clearing this, this immune trigger from the tissues and they're trying to excrete it. And so then they might have a period of feeling good for a couple of couple more weeks and then they dump again. And mm -hmm. it's like, you have to go through cycles and cycles and cycles. And really the only way to do this is to adopt a lower oxalate diet and remain with uh, remain in the situation whereby your body is continually detecting those low levels and therefore, you know, gradually clearing this stuff up. So when you're seeing a low oxalate diet, how much should we be eating? Because that's the question that I'm sure many people are thinking, well, how much spinach, how much cacao, nuts, you know, all these things. Can you give us quantities or if, if we want, so if we're not doing a carnival lifestyle, if we're doing keto lifestyle or even a low carb lifestyle, even if you're vegetarian, because I'm sure a lot of vegetarians would face this issue as well. How much of these things could we be eating? It's important to know that whilst most plants contain oxalate, like there's some very key forms which are very high, key, key plants which are very high. And then there's also many of the things which are actually quite low and can be eaten in, in large amounts. I mean, some examples, lettuce, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, cucumber, uh, mushrooms, turnips, those kinds of things. Uh, so they're you've all got good. Like, they're uh, all fine. Yeah, I mean, like... It, it's beyond the scope of this interview to, to, to give a full list of all, all the foods. But what I can say is there's lots of plant foods that don't contain high amounts of oxalate. Okay. And so actually the concept is if someone, especially if someone's on a more plant-based diet, then there are various options to, the key is, is to replace those staples. Like if you're eating a diet, which is very high um, and there's certain ways to calculate this. So I would recommend that people go to the Facebook group. It's called trying low oxalates. And on that, they have lots of guides on how to reduce the amounts of oxalates. There's also Sally Norton, who's actually got a book, which has got like 180 recipes of, um, of low oxalate kind of meals. Uh, the general consideration is that the more that you've been eating and the more that you've likely accumulated, the more it's causing your problem, then what that basically means is that the slower you're going to have to reduce it. So for instance, if someone's been eating a massive amount, I'll give you an example. The recommended uh, like or normal uh, allowance um, recommended by some kind of organizations is 150 milligrams of oxalate per day. But you could quite easily, in some cases, at least top, you know, near to 1000 milligrams if you consume smoothies and things. So like almost 10 times the amount that you should really be eating to prevent something like kidney stones. This is very common that people are on, you know, 700 milligrams per day when you take into consideration the spices and the raw cacao and, and that kind of thing. So in that kind of situation, you want, you're going to want to be reducing it um, by, you know, the example amount is five to 10% every week. So you, you would do a calculation based on the information on that group, how much you're consuming and you gradually reduce it, you gradually reduce it. And as you're doing that, you're, you're, you're replacing the high oxalate staples with the lower oxalate staples. And the idea is to get to the like 
actual scientific definition of a low oxalate diet where the body will be continually dumping this stuff is going to be uh, around about 50 milligrams. Now, 50 milligrams. You know, yeah, 50 milligrams. Wow. So you can achieve that through eating like a couple of pieces of 90% dark chocolate. So ultimately, if you've got some really high staples in the diet, then you, you need to really like, you need to reconsider that and, and start working towards a lower amount. Now, what people find, they think that they don't have a problem with oxalate, but this is one of the reasons why people who go on carnivorous diets, they feel great to start off with. And then all of a sudden they get like severe chronic diarrhea or they get severe joint pain or something like that. Oftentimes it's because they're dumping oxalate and they put it down to their diet, but really it's, it's what they're not eating that is causing their body to release this stuff, especially if they've been plant-based and things like that prior to going on this kind of diet. So the idea is to get to about 50 milligrams. In terms of other plant toxins, because you talk about not all plants are bad, not all vegetables are bad. So for example, the carnivore diet, it's touted as the optimal health diet by many um, health experts. You say that there is a place for vegetables. Vegetables aren't that bad for you. Carbohydrates aren't that bad for you and can be quite optimal for your health. Is that kind of right? Well, I think it depends on context, right? I think it's a, like if we look at, at traditional human diets, one could make an argument from an evolutionary perspective that the optimal diet is you know basically only only animal foods or minimal minimal amount of plant foods i think that you know there's a lot of kind of evidence for that but at the same time i would say that there's many populations who've eaten plants either as part a significant portion of their diet or uh, or as a supplement um to their diet for various reasons whether medicinal whether kind of like as condiments uh, and they don't seem to have any negative effects. You know, you have like uh, long lived populations and uh, the absence of heart diseases and things like that. So I think that to say that plants are toxic um, as, as a whole is is somewhat of a, a, a an oversimplified concept that I don't agree with per se. And what I would say is that also we have to factor in, and this is something which I don't think many people really discuss whatsoever in the carnivore or animal-based community is the, the concept of plants being used as medicine. You know, even in alternative medicine circles, these plants as supplements, uh, milk, thistle seed to support the liver, for instance, but, you know, really grokking uh, the, the medicinal value of plants takes, takes, takes some study. Uh, it turns out it's something that I'm very interested in. This concept that if a plant is toxic, then we shouldn't consume it at least medicinally is 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 not very well uh, it's not an educated opinion because if you look at some of the potentially toxic elements in plants they actually hold very clear medicinal value or at least it's possible it's likely that they they do at least in some circumstances so i think we need to kind of reevaluate the context in which we see plants rather than being a, um, a primary source of caloric intake, which I think mm. can become problematic for a lot of people, actually rather looking at plants for their medicinal value uh, and using them in targeted situations where it is appropriate. And that is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's um, this is evidenced by the fact that basically every traditional culture has its own form of plant medicine. Plants have been used since time immemorial, right? Thousands and thousands and thousands of years, yeah. uh, plants have been used as a form of medicine. And this is because they do hold a very specific type of value in that respect. And I think that- And what <clears throat> type of plants are you talking about? Like give us some examples if we don't, if people don't okay. know. Yeah, of course, of course. So for instance, if you, if you look at traditional forms of medicine, and this can be Ayurveda, this can be- uh, traditional Chinese medicine, those things I don't know that much about, but I am interested in the overlap between uh, those and Western herbalism or traditional Western herbalism. What we have to factor in is that before science, you know, or before we had the ability to measure phytochemicals and different chemical compounds found in plants and understand them from a scientific perspective, the healers or the, the doctors were primarily, rather than working on an experimental basis, they're looking at empirical observation, basically doing what works. 
and looking rather than understanding anatomy and physiology uh, at the level that we do in terms of biochemicals moving around and acting on different enzymes and receptors, rather what they did was they used the power of observation to see what certain plants could do at the tissue level, right? So I'll give you some example. And really this is, it's, it's a far stretch from what is considered phytochemistry from a science perspective. It's, it's more of like an energetic form of herbal medicine, which, which, which was the primary form that was practiced and it did work, right? It definitely worked. And so the way that they might characterize the way that a plant acts on the human body, they wouldn't say, oh, well, it's this phyt phytochemical doing this. They don't isolate chemicals because they couldn't. What they would do was they would see this plant exerts a drying effect or an astringent effect. And therefore, this plant is therefore beneficial in conditions which um, which are characterized by damp stagnation. So if tissue is accumulating too much fluid, if there's too much stagnation of fluid in that tissue, they might use a plant which exerts a, a, an astringent effect on that tissue. Okay. Likewise, if they determined or the way that they would classify it, if a tissue is cold or if there's poor activity of cells or poor acti activity of a tissue, like cold hands, if a, if a, if a, a group of tissues were not making what they need to do, like uh, mucous membranes or whatever, they might apply a herb or a plant which has a, a stimulating effect or a heating effect. For, mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. When you think of an astringent action of a plant on tissues, that, that is a, a tannin. A tannin, uh, if you drink a, a cup of black tea, what you notice is it has a very specific drying effect on the tongue. Right. Mm. And the stronger that tea is, it kind of makes your mouth feel as though it's kind of dry. It's a very specific sensation. And that has a systemic effect on the human body. The tannins actually, the way that they kind of dehydrate a tissue is they, they act on proteins. And so it's interesting that the way that the, 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 the kind of traditional herbalists looked at this was from a more holistic perspective, looking at how plants actually acted on tissues. The example that I gave about cool tissues or tissues which were hypometabolic, they might use remedy as particularly in Native American medicine was cayenne pepper. And you know that if you consume cayenne, it makes you feel as though you sweat. It actually yeah. increases circulation. There's yeah. Precisely. And in, our, in modern day science, we, we look at the phytochemistry behind cayenne and we see that actually activates vasodilation through a variety of mechanisms. It's remarkably beneficial for pain. Um, because right. of the capsicum and, and, and many of the other kind of uh, toxic chemicals, it has a very uh, specific effect on the human body. Now, again, without science, we don't know this, but mm. through the power of observation, we can see that some of these chemicals, which are actually considered to be toxic in large doses, um, mm. exert some, some kind of a medicinal effect. So uh, th this it comes back to this concept that plants are continually trying to adapt to the environment and for instance against pathogens against uh, bacteria against any kind of like uh, pathogenic threat they have evolved for however many years multiple inf thousands if not millions of, of chemicals which can very well protect them against infection and the concept is is that human beings have and they can use those, use that intelligence, use that form of, of kind of uh, collective experience on the behalf of the plant to treat conditions which are uh, which humans also experience. One example would be antimicrobial effects of plants. Uh, garlic, for instance, and some of the yes. other um, sulfur compounds are remarkably effective against different types of types of infection. Um, and they, they're not working. You see, if we think of antibiotics, it's one isolated chemical. When you use one isolated chemical against a bacteria, it can be very effective in the mm. short term. However, microorganisms have an ability to adapt, you know, and this is where we see antibiotic resistance show, show up. The remarkable thing about plant medicine is that because of the synergy or the synergistic effect of the numerous compounds which have antimicrobial activity against a microbe, um, there's there's basically zero uh, the zero chance that, that that any of those can can basically adapt and develop resistance. So it turns it turns out that the plants can be very effective uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials 
in the context of infection. Um, and this is applicable for many of the sulfur compounds. So if we look at, um, for instance, some of the sulfur compounds which are found or some of the, the phytochemicals which are found in, say, the cabbage family or the brassica cru cruciferous, well, you, you, may have, you may be familiar with uh, the chemicals which are referred to as glucosinolates or uh, isothiocyanates. Well, these are defense chemicals uh, which essentially occur when the plant is crushed. So for instance, if an animal was co to come a, uh, against some cabbage or some kale, when it's bitten into, it releases these toxic, toxic molecules. Uh, one of those is called sulforaphane. And uh, this is uh, highly toxic. Uh, and many of these co compounds can actually, uh, they're known to cause, they're considered to be goitrogens. What this basically means is they uh, pr prevent the binding of iodine uh, in the thyroid gland. And they also uh, inhibit another enzyme, which, we, which allows us to make thyroid hormone. So there's this mm -hmm. concept that, for instance, kale, cabbage, um, and any of the other cruciferous vegetables can actually be uh, goitrogenic and prevent thyroid fun function. And it has been the case that people who are overeating cabbage, cabbage family, um, uh, develop hypothyroid symptoms. Uh, this is well documented in the literature and it's been known for, for many years. And this is again, like coming back to the fact that plants when consumed in high quantities, they generally, um, they can be quite toxic in, in, in over the long term. But then it sounds this like if you have a specific infection or something happening and you need something like a certain medicinal quality in a plant, then that's okay. And there's certain plants that don't exhibit any um, anti-nutrient effects that might be okay, but there's some that you shouldn't be having at all. Well, this is the thing. It's like, it's, it's, it's confusing. Context, <laughs> it's context dependent. I, I'm, I don't necessarily ascribe to the view that there's some plants that people should not be having at all apart from like some extremely toxic plants. Uh, and there's, there's few of them, relatively speaking. I think that what we've done, you see, actually, if you look at many of the dietary staples, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of for the idea that the majority of, of calories should be coming from animal foods. Uh, this is because- Majority, animals... like how much? Because that sounds like hyper carnival then. Well, I mean, in the, in the realm of 60 to 70%. Yeah, that's like hyper carnivore. Yeah, yeah, to some to some extent. In terms of calories, now that Calorie. doesn't necessarily. Here's the thing that doesn't necessarily uh, like translate to the amount of food on the plate, right? Okay. Because plant oh, food in general. Point. Yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. Because the calories, yeah. the the density of calories in meat and fat is far more dense than what you'd see in like some vegetables or rice or. Of course. Okay even fruit right yeah. so 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 ultimately yeah in terms of calorically speaking i think that most of the energy and the nutritional value should come from animal foods um the reason for this is basically animals their survival mechanism is to run away that's not to say that some animals don't have some toxic um actions which can which can actually cause damage you know you have some species of fish for instance the Inuit had to process these. They had to either ferment them or they had to allow them to freeze and thaw several cycles to get rid of some of the toxins that are present in the fish. Uh, but as a general rule, animals don't have the kind of chemical uh, mechanisms which can cause damage to the human body long term. However, what we've done in the Western well, I say uh, it's not even in the Western world. It's in like modern civilization. What humans did was they bred plants to get rid of many of the kind of characteristic effects which would ordinarily be medicinal so for instance you have apples apples were highly like highly bitter they're extremely yeah. bitter yeah, they're so they taste sweet they're too sweet ah oh, exactly. exactly bananas it's like candy yeah indeed even for things like broccoli and cabbage right they yeah. did not exist like they they, they didn't exist um in their in their current form in fact most of the the vegetables at least and this applies to some of the fruits they didn't exist in their modern form in fact they had certain characteristics which made them highly unpalatable so at the same time those those unpalatable characteristics oftentimes 
are the things which hold the medicinal value. I'll give you an example, like bitter compounds. We have bitter receptors on our tongue. If you look at certain cultures, even, I mean, even like modern cultures, um, particularly traditional cultures, they use bitter herbs as a form of like a condiment prior to eating meals. And the reason for that is, is because bitter, the sensation of bitter is detected on the tongue and you have these bitter receptors which stimulate the production of bile, stimulate the release of bile from the gallbladder. And so actually bitters as a general rule are highly effective for promoting digestion. This is one of the reasons why you can buy supplemental bitters. Um, and these are these are plants which you would not eat high amounts of. For instance, dandelion greens, uh, you, wouldn't cons- you wouldn't consume high amounts of these plants but you would have a small amount to stimulate digestive juices to actually allow you to digest protein and fat in a much better way. So, th- And then your, your body um, also naturally knows when to stop because it's bitter. It knows just how much it needs. But now these days, we don't know when to stop because it's so hyper palatable. Precisely. So because these plant foods- That's why I don't have this- fruit and that's why I don't- <laughs> That's why I just yeah. cut everything out because I can't have any of that stuff. Personally. I mean, that's that's fair. And yeah, I mean, that's completely understandable. Uh, it's, it's basically like we've had, it's like because you no longer have that strong bitter flavor, which mm. would ordinarily actually hold value. What you're getting is you're getting a, a, a kind of watered down plant, which you can consume much higher amounts of, but which also contains toxins, which are not good to have in the long term. Mm. Which again, I think that if someone eats some broccoli, it's not necessarily a problem. Is it essential for the human diet? No, I don't think it is. And again, like we spoke about, you have like glucosinolates, goitrogens, which can actually cause thyroid dysfunction. Uh, in, in their more potent forms, these, these sulfur molecules have a medicinal value. I don't know if there's much medicinal value in terms of eating broccoli or cabbage. That's the thing, because I think it's been watered down. The same applies to other molecules. In fact, there's many plants that produce uh, chemicals uh, called cyanogenic glycosides. These are a form of like sugar molecule. And cyanogenic glycosides, uh, cyanogen, uh, in, in its name, it means that it basically contains cyanide or it, it can be converted by an enzyme in the human body to produce cyanide. Now, you do you know what cyanide is? Cyanide is is is, is like it's um I don't know exactly. It's it kills you. It's it, it will kill you. Yeah. It's definitely yeah, it's, it's, it's a poison. I don't know. It's it, yeah. Sorry, I was thinking of the word poison. It's a poison. You don't want cyanide. Well, that's the thing. I mean, cyanide is is like it's one of the old school poisons that that would be used. I think it's still even people. used to this day to kill people yeah. in in high doses. Well, it's contained in actually quite a lot of the different. Um, uh, plant foods, particularly the seeds. So for instance, apricot kernels, peach kernels, apple seeds, but you also find it in uh, many of the grains, for instance, uh, barley, sorghum, which are considered like non-wheat grains. Many people yeah, consume healthy. these in high amounts. Yeah, Precisely. Uh, there's lots of plants which contain this. And this is really actually designed by the plant to pre- 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 prevent pests from eating it, right? And it makes kind of makes sense. Like plants are going to concentrate a lot of their toxins in the seeds because the only way in which the plant lives on through its offspring is via its seeds. And so what you want to do is you want a situation where the fruit is consumed, the seeds are consumed whole, and then the animal is going to go and disperse seeds elsewhere. And this is the way in which plants spread their kind of, you know, their resources across an environment and it's how they pass, you know, they, they get passed. So this is one of the reasons why fruit can be sweet or can be palatable, whereas the seeds generally not so, and the seeds are quite mm. toxic. So in the case of a- apples, if you were to consume, you know, a, a cup of apple seeds, uh, it could potentially be fatal in some people. So it's found in, in several different kinds of plants. Now, this is considered a toxin and it is a toxin, if you were to consume large amounts of this as a dietary staple. On the other hand, these products such as wild cherry bark, which contains very high amounts of these cyanogenic glycosides, is also highly medicinal. Now, whether the uh, whether the herbal kind of action is just due to the glycosides or whether it's due to something else entirely or whether it's due to the synergy, we don't know. But what it can say is, is there's many cases in which 
herbs which use this or which contain this in high amounts can be used. Uh, for instance, cherry bark or elder, um, they have expectorant or sedative properties. They've been used for many years uh, for a variety of different things. They can they can um, be used in conditions where there's a hyperexcitability hyperexcitability of tissues, for instance, if the bronchioles, if in lung conditions, someone uh, has excess spasms, they use as muscle relaxants, relaxants, and they're generally very effective. I follow a carnival diet because I just feel better. I don't eat any vegetables, any fruits, anything. I just eat meat, eggs, butter. What's your thoughts about that for the long term? It depends on each person, right? Like, like I was talking about, like you have a low level underlying toxicity coming in from plants. Like I was just saying about the glycoalkaloids in someone who's cons consuming nightshades, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, potatoes long-term, and they have an underlying chronic inflammatory condition, then that is probably going to be worsening that. Okay. So if someone has this kind of condition and they consume a diet, like you just described, well, that's going to reduce the overall burden of inflammation. Um, does that mean that these plants are going to cause that in everyone? That's debatable. I think for someone who has a very severe condition, um, it's going to be important to avoid them, at least temporarily. Uh, but at the same time, like whilst these kind of chemicals like solanine can trigger an inflammatory condition for someone or can worsen it, at the same time, these glycoalkaloids also hold a certain medicinal value. You know, they've been used historically for, you know, uh, they, they not only do they exert a toxic effect on human cells, they also exert a toxic, toxic effect on, on fungus and bacteria. So they've been classically used uh, for lung infections or for systemic infections or for, you know, gut infections. They, they have their role. And I think the problem is like the potato or these other nightshades, they've been bred to be such a way to be hyper palatable. I think consuming other plants, which also contain these, these chemicals uh, in, a, in a lower amount uh, is probably going to be better for someone. And again, it's context dependent. I don't think that it's ever set in stone. I have many yeah. people who use the carnival diet as basically like a reset. Okay. Like a it's elimination diet. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's not a permanent thing. Mm. Um, it's like they will go on carnival and they'll do it for say six months. And then what they start doing is reintroducing foods, um, which actually have, a, a which they can tolerate and, and they get to the point where actually they can eat a much more balanced diet. For some people, they just need to stay away from say the nightshades. Other people, they need to stay away from the oxalates. In fact, I don't see carnivore as a death sentence. You know, some people see that it is. It's more of a tool. But thank you so much, Elliot.